сан байцгааны өхөн төлөгчтэй. Өнөөдөр ороо манай де факто нэвтрүүлгийн зочноор дэлхийн хамгийн том компаниудын нэг General Electric Company а засгийн газрын харилцаа бодлого хариуцсан дид ер нь хийлгч оролцож байна. Karen Bata. Karen Bata. General Electric Company засгийн газрын харилцаа болон бодлого хариуцсан дид ер хийлгч Karen Bata General Electric Company-г төлөөлөн дэлхийн улс орнуудын засгийн газартаа нийтийн бодлогын асуудлаар яриа хилцэр хийх дэлхийн зах зээл дээрх компани байр зургийг өргөжүүлэх үүрэгтэй ажиллаж байна. Батия General Electric Company нэгдэхээс өмнө Америк нэгдсэн улсын засгийн газрын худалдааны шадар төлөөлөгч Аз Африкийн хариуцсан төлөөлөгчөөр ажиллаж байна. Тэр Вьетнам, Хятад, Энэтхэг улсдаа амжилттай яриа хилцэр хийж Америк нэгдсэн улс өмнө Солонгосын худалдааны хилцэрийг байгуулахад гол өргөж үүсгэсэн гав ятаа. Батия олон улсын худалдаа тээврийн бодлогын талаар өгүүлэл бичиж илтгэл тавьж байж юм. Жор тауны эхсэргүйлд багшилж Конгрест мэдээлэл өгч байсан. Батия Фрэнкстоны эхсэргүйлд Баклаур Лондонын эдийн засгийн сургууль Колумбийн эхсэргүйлийг тус тус мастер зэрэгтэй төгссөн. Эхнэр хоёр хүүхдтэй. Good evening. Good evening. What brought you to Mongolia? Uh, it's very exciting for me to be in Mongolia. It's my first visit uh, here. It's a country I've long wanted to visit, but uh, for GE we are doing more business and have a stronger focus on Mongolia than ever. So it's a chance for me to meet with government, to meet with some private sector stakeholders uh, and get a better feel for the country. That's great that uh, your level executives come into this country of uh, such a company which can with your standard and uh, environmental operation standards can impact a lot on, what, wh- on the way what we do the business. Uh, what kind of businesses you are involved with, with Mongolia? Well, we, uh, GE is a very broad infrastructure company around the world. We're probably the biggest infrastructure company. And uh, the breadth of our businesses is the different areas that we are in and hope to be in even more in Mongolia. Uh, first, uh, energy, uh, all kinds of energy, but we have a particular interest in renewable energy, uh, power generation. and. That's one area where we're already working with Mongolia mm-hmm. uh, with respect to wind, uh, yes. wind turbines and power generation there. Um, another line of business is transportation, uh-huh. where we do everything from manufacture air- aircraft engines, engines yes. uh, to locomotives. Yes. Um, and believe there's a lot of possibilities to, to work in and with Mongolia in those areas. Uh, healthcare. We are one of the largest manufacturers in the world of healthcare devices, things like MRI machines or CT scan machines. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's another area. Uh, and we also have a, a financial services business where we will lease uh, products, aircraft engines or aircraft or en- uh, energy products. Um, so all of these are things that we're excited about Mongolia. We think there's a great market here and uh, see a lot of potential. Well, before uh, some of them, we will, I would like to t- a little bit ask more questions. Sure. Please tell us to our audience about the size, how many employees in terms of market capitalization, what is the, your rank? Well, we're, we're, we're uh, a very big company uh, in the world. We're, uh, you know, market capitalization goes up and down, but we're generally in the top uh, 15 companies in the world. Uh, we have um, close to uh, 280, 290,000 employees globally. Uh, we are um, headquartered in the United States, but we operate in more than 100 countries around the world. Um, we are in, as I said, in many different sectors as well. So we're a pretty good barometer, I think, for the global economy. Because how many, uh, asset-wise, billion, how many billion? Uh, we, revenues of $150 billion uh, and market capitalization in that, n- in that neighborhood. Okay, $150 billion revenue. Yeah. Um, um, well, Mongolians are always... Uh, very much aware about Thomas Edison, who is the founder of the company, and uh, what you can tell about him. No, it's a hundred years. uh, More than that, actually. A company founded in 1860s. Um, Yes, we were founded by Thomas Edison, one of the great inventors in not just American, but global history. Uh, Invented the light bulb, and indeed that was how GE began, as uh, 
uh, as, as, as a lighting company. We continue to have a lighting business to this day, yes. uh, actually, although it's a very different product than it used to be yes. before. We're now at the cutting edge of lighting technology yes. with LED lighting yes. and other sources. But, um, but, you know, Edison was one of the great inventors. He always was pushing the boundaries of innovation. Uh, and also, what people don't know about Edison was he was a great, not just a great I innovator, but he was a great businessman. He really understood the importance of efficient uh, production methods. He placed a great deal of emphasis on corporate reputation and brand. And those are things that we try and uh, follow through on today. Uh, we when you were listed first time? When was GE listed? G GE was the very first company w w in the original uh, Dow Jones yes. Industrial Average. So this goes back to the 1880s, I believe. Uh, yes. So a very long time, and is the only surviving company in the Dow Jones Industrial Dow Jones Average. Up to now. Exactly. In the industrial yeah. index of yeah. uh, New York Stock Exchange, yes. Dow Jones. Uh, that's, a, you know, that's, a, that's a great company. Yeah. And I will ask, uh, I have been studying and I have learned a bit more, and uh, I will ask more about what makes that company great. Uh, before that, um, you were talking about the energy and uh, wind yeah. farm. What part of this wind farm and with whom you are supplying this product to Mongolia? We uh, have a partnership with Newcom, the Newcom yes. Group, uh, and uh, have our initial project is uh, with the Salkit Wind Farm and uh -huh. our um, supplying uh, wind turbines there. We, we produce the turbines and the blades, yes. uh, uh, and we often will, uh, we, we, we source different pieces and products around the world, um, but, uh, but it's a, it's a, we have a 1.5 megawatt uh, uh, power product that is well suited, we think, to the Mongolian market. So every this big, we call it the propeller as well, yeah. uh, wind uh, turbine. What is the capacity of one single one? Uh, well, you can, d they can the vary, one but 1.5 uh, one, me 1 megawatts. 1.5 megawatts, and yeah. how many of them will be here? Well, at the, at the moment, we're, we're, uh, it's a 50 megawatt uh, uh -huh. uh, facility, but we're hoping that Mongolia, Mongolia has a great resource in wind. Yes. It is wonderful. It, well, is, it could be the Saudi Arabia for wind. Yeah. And uh, okay. <laughs> and so and so, in addition to many other obviously yes. energy resources, it's 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 very blessed in that regard. So we think there's a lot of possibility for uh, the growth of wind power here going yes. forward. That's what we're waiting for, and it will be another alternative exactly. energy resource for Mongolians. Absolutely, in particular for the city, we are very much of the smoke problem in the winter, and yeah. uh, this is uh, one of the good uh, way of uh, dealing with. Yeah. Uh, that's good, and uh, with the, uh, you are with the uh, wind turbine, uh, the um, turbine is provided by you. Um, uh, if there is any, uh, you have been already providing or selling some uh, locomotives to the Mongol Railway. We rail do, we, we, we've provided a, a couple. I think uh, all told there are 17 locomotives or so in Mongolia mm. in, the, in the fleet that are, that are GE mm. manufactured. The most recent I think was a Evo locomotive, one of our most environmentally mm -hmm. um, advanced locomotives with far lower emissions uh, very high productivity. These are these are massive locomotives that pull can pull hundreds of cars and uh, typically are used for freight locomotives. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we think that as particularly with the development of the mining sector here in Mongolia and the mm -hmm. need to be able to move product efficiently into mm -hmm. destinations, that there's a great opportunity there to work with uh, with Mongolian um, um, rail uh, companies, but also um, with private sector companies as they look to uh, uh, build up their transport capacity as well. Uh, at a certain time, it was very much hardware company, General Electric was, and then suddenly you be start to become a TV company, then uh, I mean bought TV and yeah. uh, many other things not completely in the line, uh, but still you made the success and you, General Electric, Credit, right? Uh, Company, yeah. Uh, capital. Capital. GE capital. And, uh, what is the what is it the share in whole total business? GE capital. C GE capital probably is uh, in the neighborhood of about forty percent of our revenues. Although that is probably going down mm -hmm. uh, a little bit. The 
the goal of the, uh, the company uh, coming out of the financial crisis is to reposition ourselves. At, at one point, GE Capital, or the financial services portion of the company, mm. amounted for uh, even a little bit more than 50% of our total well, revenues. Yeah. And that, that's probably more than we wanted. That was uh, an overemphasis. And How so was the uh, crisis? Well, the crisis was difficult. I mean, the crisis was, was very difficult Obviously, for our yeah. company and for many companies. And I think one of the things it forced us to do was re-examine our portfolio. And uh, we, we're an industrial company at the end of the day. Uh, capital is a very important piece to it. Financial uh -huh. service is an important piece. But however, it's 40% today. And it's about 40%, and it'll probably, you know, I think uh, our Chairman Jeff sort of indicated he wants it a little bit lower than that. Does it, does it include that specialty insurance you had? We, we're not in the insurance business anymore. anymore. Okay. We're not in insurance business. We're not, you also mentioned media. Uh, yeah. we, we own 49% of a company called NBC Universal. Yes, yes. Um, uh, Still, yeah. <laughs> we, 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 but that, uh, we sold 51% last year. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so you're going to see that. Uh, we're, we, we no longer have a controlling interest in that. Mm -hmm. So combining all this is businesses and employing 290,000 people all around the world should be uh, something that I think a lot of things for Mongolians to learn in management terms. Well, uh, look, I think you, and you alluded to this a little bit before, I think one of the things that we try to do when we work with partners around the world or when we invest is um, help share our learnings. I mean, we've been a, a company for um, 100 and 150 years, uh, effectively. And uh, over that period of time, you learn a lot. Um, I'm actually relatively new to the company. I've only been with the company four years. But yeah, that's what is I also want to ask. Before joining the company, you have been working for the U.S. Uh, U.S. Uh, government. government. Yeah. And uh, what, w what kind of positions you have been different, in? Different positions. Uh, I started uh, in early 2000 uh, at the Commerce Department, where I uh, administered a bureau, helped administer a bureau that... Uh, oversaw U.S. export controls, so mm -hmm. res sort of the restrictions on technology, sensitive technology going globally. And then I moved to the transport ministry where I uh, ran uh, all the international programs for uh, the Secretary of Transportation, the Minister of Transportation. And then I finished uh, as the President, uh, President Bush's lead trade negotiator for Asia and Africa. So uh, there it was pure international trade uh, trade. Activities. You were a part of this free, free trade agreement with Korea? I was. I was the, uh, oversaw those negotiations. And uh, it was, I mean, since that it is done, now sometimes Koreans are getting very unhappy. <laughs> but overall, did you, have you reached the aim you have? I think so. I think so. It took a long time. It was a controversial agreement in Korea and in the United States. It took, it uh -huh. took what a was long that time. Much? Making controversial. Well, I, you know, it was an agreement that was very, uh, it was a big step for both sides. Uh -huh. uh, for Korea, it re required them to change a number of their laws, lower barriers to imports in a lot of different sectors, uh, agriculture in particular, which is always very sensitive. Yes. And country, so you yeah. had you had strong, powerful political forces in Korea that were quite concerned about that. And, and in the U.S., they, they were, were very too. committed and they did it. They, at the end of the day, both governments had a lot of political commitment at very senior levels. And both economies is winning. And both economies win. Trade is, a, trade is an unquestionable driver of economic growth. Please tell us about the merit of the free trade agreement, why many nations want to have this agreement with each other, in particular with the U.S. Why? You know, I, I think the key thing to think about trade is uh, that tr trade is a is a tax-free way. It is a way that governments can grow their economies without taxing more, without spending more. It's simply by reducing barriers to economic activity globally. You're able to capture the opportunities. So exactly. a country like Mongolia will have unlimited opportunities to export to the United States with no barriers if there you if you have an agreement. FTA. Yes. Likewise, the United States will be able to invest more in Mongolia, will be able to benefit Is it from realistic in between Mongolia and America? I think so. I think now's the time what to start is, thinking about it. What does it take to... Well, to first and foremost, it takes political commitment. It's going to take both leaders to and commit uh, to this. And a lot of economic to ties also? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the point of an FTA is to create new economic ties. Yes. So you need some basis of interaction to be able to sort of demonstrate the importance of it. If there was no engagement, that would be hard. 
But there is engagement between the U.S. and Mongolia. There's trade flows right now. There are good trade flows. There can be more, and that's what I think we need to look towards. The similar, with the similar talking, you have been working for APEC. I have, yeah. And uh, APEC made some moratorium for membership. Yes. India, Mongolia, some Latin American, nine, seven countries yeah. want to be there, and yeah. you the guys close the door. Why? Yeah. Well, look, I'm not with APEC. I was wi with the United States government when we were part of APEC, and now I head up an association of global companies that are very interested in APEC. So I spend a lot of time with APEC. I, I think the challenge with APEC is it's big right now. It's 21 countries, and um, you start hitting a point where it's difficult to be able to negotiate uh, new agreements, you know, getting 21 of anybody sure. is hard. Okay. But look, if I think about countries who I would love to see at, yes. at part, I think Mongolia would be a great partner. You know, Europe, the European Union, EEC, et cetera, they have monetary union, et cetera, and the Asia is some, uh, hopping in. There are tons of international uh, agreements. Uh, mechanisms, yeah. agreements, but no, there is a none other than APEC. I think they must uh, w more or less work on one than APEC. I think APEC's the premier trade and economic organization in, in East Asia. Uh, how do you see integration of Mongolia with uh, either in this AT Asia Pacific region? region? Look, I think Mongolia is uh, an economy that would benefit from greater integration Certainly. into the global economy. I think it would help diversify it. I think it would help bring in different kinds of investment, and I think it would help bring Mongolia into the global trading system. So whether it's APEC, obviously Mongolia is part of the WTO, which is a good thing, uh, but, but uh, in general, I think the more Mongolia can do to integrate itself in the global economy, the better it will be for Mongolians. Do you think with the uh, Russian accessions to WTO, what kind of benefits as WTO member Mongolia can take or claim or well, think? Mongolia will be the beneficiary because when Russia joins the WTO, and hopefully that will happen uh, here in the next month or two, um, it, R Mongolia will get the benefit of all of Russia's commitments to the WTO. So there will be lower tariffs, lower barriers, lower duties, uh, greater ease of access. And look, for a country like Mongolia that's right on Russia's border, that should be a ready opportunity to be able to export more. And we have yet, we have a big problem with Russia in terms of exporting our meat, and there are some reasons, objective, not objective, and we do not address in the plus Russia, Russia suddenly uh, closed the, uh, closed the uh, border uh, entry. But this is, this is one of the great things about the WTO, because what the WTO will allow you to do is to seek dispute settlement. So in other words, if they do that and it's against the rules, you can take them to court, a global court, which is the WTO mechanism, and they c the WTO will tell Russia, you have to let them, uh, the Mongolian meat or other things in, or else Mongolia can close their market to you. So that's the great thing about the WTO. It's an enforceable mechanism. Well, for a country like Mongolia, 100% dependent on the Russian oil and oil product. And it's, uh, it is also very There are always complications. There are always challenges. But it's, it's, it is an international legal mechanism that has been shown to work. Uh, let's go, let's back to, uh, uh, to uh, general election. Sure. You have very interesting system for uh, Mongolian audience. Uh, this new chairman. Mm -hmm. Chairman of uh, GE is sort of almost president or executive, the most CEO, right? Yes. It's a little bit different than chairman of the board. Yes. Why? Well, he is both chair, Je you're, you're talking about Jeff Immelt, yes. who is there. He is chairman of the board and CEO of our company. So you hold two oh, roles I see. at the same time. And it's enormously powerful person in <laughs> terms of the company. And I this structure keeps going on. Yes, we've had, uh, we've had our chairmen are, are uh, typically there for quite some time. They have quite a bit of tenure. Jeff's been there for 10 years. and. Yes. I hope we'll be there for many more years to come. Um, and it is, it's, a, it's an important position. Remember when the, with the previous Jack Welsh? Yes. He, he said, we want to be number one or yeah. number two in yeah. any business yeah. we are in. Yeah. Have you done it? 
Uh, look, I think that continues to be very much sort of the focus of the company. We want to be the best that we can be and the best that there is in every field that we're in. And if and we're not, you know, it's hard to be successful as a, a company in the highly competitive world today. you've got today yeah. if you're not operationally, technologically, uh, in every way, uh, sort of at the top of your game. So it's certainly an emphasis for us. Uh, he said the famous words, fix, sell, or, uh, or, or get out. Or yeah. get out. Yeah. And what kind of business uh, new chairman got out? Well, I, I don't, you know, Jeff, Jeff has uh, looked at the whole portfolio, and um, if you look at the company we have today, it's a very different company than it was when Jeff uh, became chairman positions. 10 years ago. The, back then, GE Plastics, I mean, our chairman grew up in a, yes. in a business called GE Plastics, yes. which was core to the company, and yes. we no longer own that business. We sold it. Uh, in my time there, we've sold a number of businesses, including NBC Universal, a 51% stake there. So we do, we do um, it's a constantly evolving business, which is one of the things that makes it fun to work there. You have, you have been always innova innovating many concepts in terms of, in particular, human resources. Mm -hmm. uh, the Six Sigma concept, yes. was you made the big mess around the world and good movement for capital gain. Is it still there? Six Sigma? Yeah, I mean, Six Sigma is still there. Lean manufacturing techniques yes. are still there. I mean, these are all parts of sort of the GE production um, ethos. And, and there's always an emphasis on uh, trying to be as efficient uh, and as good as you can be. Is this uh, C Sessions? Sessions C. Yes, you've, you've, you, uh, th th this actually, to be honest with you, as I joined the company, is one of the things that's impressed me most. The, the term of art you're referring to is logo within our company, it's called Session C's, but they are HR reviews, human resources reviews, where we do a very deep analysis of personnel. And in general, the amount of time and effort that this company gives to evaluating people, hiring people, firing people, uh, uh, promoting people, training people, all aspects of people management is extraordinary, uh, just extraordinary to me. And I think that's one of the lessons that I have picked up from this company is how important that process is to management. That's one of the things which makes completely competitive your company. I think so. We always have a good talent. I think so. We, we tr pride ourselves on trying to develop great leaders. I mean, uh, you said human resource review. What is the turnover of staff compared uh, the level on the average and uh, compared to your close next competitor I don't I don't have the numbers I, I you know my sense is that we invest a lot in people uh, at GE and uh, what's interesting to me is as I you know look at the people who are at the senior levels of the company uh, I, I've got to tell you, I'm really the exception. Most people have not come from another career. Many people have sort of grown up in the company exactly, yes. and, and have become progressively and more they keep senior. keep rotating also. To there's some. a lot of, yeah, it, traditionally there was a lot of rotation. We see yes. a little bit less of that now. I think there's uh -huh. more of an emphasis on really building expertise in an area. But, uh, but yeah, I, you know, the, the, it's a company that has managed to find its great leaders from within its own, its own hiring ranks. With your size, you are one of the successfully entrance company to dot com business. It's on time. Probably now, it's you are more dot com company. We are becoming more of a software company, more mm -hmm. of an IT company, and it's a big focus for uh, for Jeff for our for our businesses. Um, you know, we believe that there. Well, I don't think we're ever going to become a traditional software or, mm -hmm. or IT company. Sure. But there is a lot of intelligence that exists within industrial products, and trying to understand that and, and capture the benefits of that, I think it's an important value for our customers, and I think it's important for our company. You, you as a global company, uh, of course, in, among your executives, pro, uh, also you uh, have a global staff, right? Yes, Different absolutely. Absolutely, big emphasis on that. On that. Um, General Electric, uh, in fact, the credit G Capital started the business with, remember, the leasing to in Thailand. Exactly. Of cars. Yeah. So how was that, uh, this sort of business being reflected or repeated Globally, again? yeah. I, I mean, look, I think um, our, our, 
a year ago, Jeff decided to create, or the company decided to create a new uh, entity called the Global Growth and Operations Function. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is really our attempt to figure out how do we become better, a better global company. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we've done is divided the, co the world into 12 different regions. We've brought in very senior people to run each of those regions. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of the functions that mm -hmm. um, previously might have been broken down or handled out of the United States were moving into the regions. Um, the, the bottom line for us is we recognize that global growth, frankly, mm -hmm. is going to be driven by emerging markets. It's going to be driven by places like Mongolia. Mm -hmm. And figuring out how do you become a better company in those regions means that we have to have people in those regions. We've got to have uh, expertise in that region. We have a local office here. We do, we do. We opened a an Mongolian office representative. in 2011. Well, a great, great Mongolian representative, Mr. Uh, Tumen, Mr. Tumen yes, uh, has uh -huh. been, has been uh, our leader here. And uh, look, I think we're going to see the continued growth that we're going to be hiring more people. This uh, 12 regions, we belong to which part? Uh, which, where is the office headquarters it's for Mongolia? F well, no, Mongolia is its own. We have a headquarters here in Ulaanbaatar. Right, it's so grouped far. in with the broader Greater China region. I see. Yeah. Mm. Uh, do you see further uh, with the equipment, with whatever you supply to Mongolia, do you see the somehow sort of uh, creation of competitiveness in this country so that we can export our things, services to neighbor countries? Uh, look, I, I, again, I've only been here for one day, but we've spent quite a bit of time looking at Mongolia globally. We do a lot of research yes, about different countries before we invest. I, I'm, I'm very bullish on Mongolia. I really am. I think the combination of the natural resources strengths, the key location, the geographic location, but also the people and the, and the institutions and the systems. I mean, the reality is that Mongolia actually, in many respects, rates quite well in a number of sort of the World Bank doing business indicators, uh, particularly given its sort of overall average GDP level. So I think there is a commitment to institutions here that leaves me very uh, optimistic for Mongolia. You are uh, quite relatively young man to be uh, in the, such a big position of such a big company. And I explain it also, of course, many merits. But I see in uh, your uh, bio, you have done the best possible schools in the world. Harvard, uh, yeah, uh, Princeton University, then School of Economics in London, yeah. then Colombo. Columbia University of Columbia. I mean, was it difficult? <laughs> uh, I, I was very fortunate to be able to go to great academic uh, schools. I I, uh, I feel very lucky. I, I, um, I d they give you great opportunities. But I think for me, one of the things that they've also done is instilled in me a sense of the need to give back. Uh, you know, my undergraduate school that I went to is Princeton, and its its motto is Princeton in the nation's service. Princeton in, uh, okay. and, and I Jersey, translated yeah. into Princeton in the world service, to be yeah. honest with you. I, I honestly believe, I love working for GE, but the thing I love most about it is around the world every day, we're able to do things that actually improve people's lives. You know, provide healthcare equipment that saves lives, or provide energy, power generation equipment that helps power villages that wouldn't have it before, or clean water, uh, or provide transportation to connect people. That just makes you feel good. And so I, I, I feel good about what we're able to do. You, which, how many generations of Americans you are? My father was uh, an immigrant from India. India. Yeah. And what was he doing first came to? He was a, he's an economist, actually. Economist. And yeah. he was in, uh, he, he was studied in uh, He in studied India in India and then studied in uh, the U.S. US. after that. And when he uh, came to the oh, U.S.? I came to the U.S. in the 1960s. 60s. Early, early 60s. Okay. And how many brothers, siblings? Uh, one sister. One sister. Lives in Singapore, actually. Singapore. Yeah. What is she doing? She uh, she uh, has uh, she works at the, a business school there. She uh -huh. uh, administers a business school and raises two beautiful little girls. Great. How about you? Two boys. Two boys. Yeah. Where are they? Uh, at, at home, hopefully, given the hour asleep at this yes. point in time, Which uh, state? Where, where they live home? outside of Washington D.C. My wife and I and our two sons. Uh, well, so. Uh, 
these studying the, in these schools, you got some scholarship, and how how come? I mean, it's it is very exp each of them is very expensive schools. They're expensive, you know, in the U.S. they are expensive, but you get a combination of student loans uh, and uh, uh, some grants and other things uh, enable it. And back then it was cheaper. I'm not that young. I, back then it was uh, yeah. it was a little bit cheaper to be able to do it. Today it's quite expensive for people. Well, it's the, it takes uh, not only finance but also courage, <laughs> a, lot, a lot of hard work, <laughs> determination. Well, it's uh, it, it, it's uh, it's been fun. And have you, career-wise, as a professional who have done these wonderful educational institutions, career-wise, have you have you done what you wanted? Uh, boy, that's a tough question. Um, look, I I feel like I've I, I've had a very um, rewarding career thus far. I've I've had the opportunity. I, I after my academic training, I. Uh, went to work for a law firm. Uh, I became a partner at a law firm in Washington, and mm -hmm. I, I did that uh, mm -hmm. in international law practice. Then I went into the government and did that, and now I'm with a big company. So I feel like I've gotten three different perspectives, law, government, and now business. Um, I don't know what will come next, but uh, but uh, I don't think I'm at the end of my career, I, I, but I, I'm enjoying what I'm doing. That's a great company to work, I believe. It's, it is a great company. Thank you. Have you, what is your the best achievement so far? You think? Well, I, look, I think I think in a very big macro sense, one thing that we've managed to do in the last four years at the company is, particularly coming out of the financial crisis, is sort of not only reconfigure the portfolio of the company, but build into the company a sense of the importance of working with government. Uh, I mean, you you in, in the past. Um, to be honest with you, GE has not always worked closely with government. We've often tried to uh, work in areas that are deregulated or that haven't required us to work with government. And I think what we've appreciated is that in the future, particularly as we become more global, governments are an omnipresent uh, part of life. And you need to be able to communicate with them effectively. You need to be able to work with them, partner with them. Um, and so we've tried to build up both the capability in the company and the mindset in the company to be effective at working with governments, government in the United States, governments around the world. And so that's one of the things that we've been trying to do. What is the m worst, uh, very hard things to work with government, particularly like uh, governments like Mongolia or developing countries? Well, I, you know, I think, uh, n not in reference to Mongolia at all, but, you know, in a lot of countries around the world, there are capacity issues. You know, there are issues, it's not a... Institutional capacity. It is. It's, it's, you know, we see tenders for large projects that go through multiple reiterations or that get slowed, and sometimes there's problems with the process, but sometimes it's just simply capacity uh, issues. What you can, how do you can change it? You have been working with the Well, we do. I, look, I think government. this is a, this is, well, I, I'm not going to hold the U.S. up as a model. We have our own problems, I think. But, but I, I, look, I do think this is a big area that we need to focus on globally, uh, and that is how do you work with governments to improve their capacity mm -hmm. to be able to undertake the kinds of things that government needs to do? tender, build infrastructure, make the right decisions, move processes quickly through the process. Mm. Um, those, are, those are things that don't, aren't immediately apparent when you're, when you're uh, uh, relatively uh, you know, dynamic economy or where, where you're a new country in some cases. So that's something that I think the international community, and I look to maybe the WTO or UN institutions to do a better job of helping build capacity around that. What is the most efficient, uh, what, what makes the government the most efficient in your opinion? Procedure, uh, process, or what? I th yeah, I mean certainly process, procedure, transparency, Tr all of those things I think are, are key to efficient government uh, governments. Um, I think, to be honest with you, professionalization. I, I, think, I think treating government procurement and government uh, whatever area of government, as a real professional specialization, not somewhere where you put people when they've got, uh, you know, a relative in a political office or where you've got, but, but and rewarding them, you know, paying them a, a, a decent wage for a, a valuable service done is a very important part of, of building a professional, top quality government.
obviously being in this uh, sector you are responsible for, for GE working with the governments of mm -hmm. other countries, over 100 countries. Uh, so you, you keep traveling a lot, right? We do, yeah, I do. You do, uh, and how many days a month? Uh, probably about uh, somewhere between two to three weeks a month. Two, probably. three weeks a month. So yeah. you are staying only a week or so at home, and plus you are through all this different time zones. Yeah, you do a lot of different time zones. So how do you survive? <laughs> uh, you get sleep where you can. I've become very good at sleeping on planes or wherever, you, wherever I can find time. Wherever you have to also exercise? You do. I, I do try do? to do that. I, I go to a lot of gyms. Uh -huh. So, you know, a ho hotel, hotel gyms. And keep confusing something. Exactly. You, you do. You don't know where you are. Where you are. I've <laughs> done that before, too. <laughs> but, uh, but look, it's, it's part of the job, and it's a great, great opportunity to be able to work with governments. Well, my final question is, sure. do you feel more, are you, I mean, are you, you yourself feeling more Americans or Indians or... What's your well, that's a great point? question. I, I actually, you know, it was funny. I, the other day, I was at an event, internal event, where one of the questions was, what's the biggest challenge your government faces? And I didn't have an answer because I feel like in this role, I work for with many different governments. So I get to see uh, the strengths and weaknesses of all of them. Uh, and I feel a sense of uh, affinity with many of them. So, look, I'm an American citizen. I'm very proud to be uh, having worked for the U.S. government, but I also feel uh, a real sense of partnership with our global partners around the world, and that includes many governments and uh, certainly includes the government of Mongolia, who I have enjoyed working with. You know, Mr. Bhatia, in Mongolia, we, uh, as a Mongolian business community, we would like to see a company of your size, reputation, and name not only uh, being a trading partner, and also but some some sort of your have on your businesses here, whatever you possibly find. Sure. And that would be a great contribution towards this economy, not only in terms of the output, but the process itself, standard, human resources. Mm -hmm. These are the things what we want to see in Mongolia. Just that's what I'm telling you as a, a Mongolian citizen and as a business community representative. Thank you. I, I take that very much to heart. And uh, again, I'm very encouraged by what I see in Mongolia. And um, I think there'll be a great future for GE and Mongolia together. Well, let it be. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.